I mean, I've sort of made peace with all of my guys that I've had issues with over the years, but Dan's exists a cock bag. <laughs> There's no two ways about it. And uh, he just, in 1985, he just said he was going to be a rock star and fuck all of his punk rock friends. That was kind of the attitude. I went to a Sam Haynes show in Baltimore, and for no reason, he was just totally Iceman to me. And I'm like, what's going on? He's like, just wouldn't talk to me, nothing. So uh, that was the end of that. We used to be good buds. We hung out with the Misfits. We went there and, and stayed with Jerry and... Jerry and Dory were living in their parents' basement, and Glenn was living in his parents' basement. The rumor was he was still getting $25 a week allowance from his folks. <laughs> he was the badass singer of the Misfits. <laughs> we even snuck into his medicine cabinet to see what his real last name was. You guys know what his real last name is. It's Glenn Anazaloni. Not very, not very rock and roll dandy, sinister. Then again, neither is Bob Vermeulen's Thus Tesco V was born. Well, I did that because I was hiding out, too, because I would say things like TSOL or sissies. Now, what the fuck was I thinking when I said that? I'll tell you what I was thinking. I saw a picture of them. There were these monster surfer dudes, and I'm like, I'm going to call those guys sissies and just see what happens. <laughs> a cool thing to do and it got it, it like blew up i'm ron martinez my my booking agent's like man we were all like tsol guys man we were sitting in la going man looking at pictures of the meat men like, those guys look like fags <laughs> TSOL could definitely, you know who's, who could who could take who in a you know in a cage match or i don't know what and uh brian's like yeah man they're just calling you they're calling you sissies well ian he was saying yeah ian's you know part of it you know just anyway because they didn't like each other at the time. So Ian comes bounding down the stairs like, hey guys. They like jacked him up against the wall. Sissies, huh? And uh, Ian had to talk his way out of that, and which he's good at doing. Because he's not a big guy. But um, of course, then he calmed them down and they got in the van and drove to the next town. And they were like, hey, here you guys are sissies. So it's amazing how a little old fanzine that was putting out 100 copies could you know, create such a, a stir, as it were, in the pre-internet age. The internet was great for what it is, but the internet will also preclude anything like this from ever happening again. Because back then, they see individual little towns and scenes were allowed to kind of find their way, and, their, and the scenes kind of uh, were allowed to um, percolate. I don't know what the word is become what they are. Now the internet is so immediate. I mean, people have told me, but I read it, I, you know, like my buddy said, I read a review of the birthday parties for Seven Inch and Touch and Go. It took me six months to find the record. And in that six months, I was just like on this quest. And it's like nowadays, it's like, you know, there it is. I'm done with it, next. So it's like, it's hard to describe, but back then we were hungry for the new music. I would say it's like being in one of those glass cages and the dollars on the game show were swirling around was 45s, and we were grabbing it as many as we could. We would review some of the most obscure shit and hear sometimes records that sucked and say they were great just because we would fuck with people's heads and they'd be out there looking for them. <laughs> just because that's how we were. We were kind of arrogant, but I look back and I'm like, you know, I'm kind of proud that we were like that. We were like, this is the music, and we know about it, and you don't, and we're gonna tell you, we're gonna tell you about it. And, you know, the top and bottom 40, there's stuff in there that I'm like, why are Mata Hoople's on the bottom 40 this month? Well, two months later, they're in the top 40. You know, marijuana was on both the top and bottom 40 because it depends on whether I was getting high or not. And it's very random, very arbitrary. We had a reader's poll. I had a guy that came out of the woodwork in 1980. This guy, Wiley, was just like the Otis Campbell of Lansing, you know, the, the guy that was so wasted at all his shows. So... Biggest drunk of 1980 is Wiley. And so when the book came out, there was a letter to the editor to this magazine that like, Tesco V made me stop drinking 20 years ago or something. 20 years ago, it took, it took you 10 years. But it's like, you know, it's like, we actually got votes that you were the biggest drunk. I didn't make that one up. A lot of the stuff I would make up because, you know, readers poll, I mean, 100, 200 issues. 
and you know, just just shed in the free pot. Uh, oh, the the one that ended my friendship with Henry Rollins. Let's look at that one. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have even seen the book, but if I could find it, uh, Pusshead is all over the book. I mean, we have like Edward Culver, we have uh, Glenn Friedman. Everybody was kind enough to allow us to use their stuff. Because think about it, it's shotgun journalism, and you need a picture of of somebody, you steal it out of another magazine. That's just the way fanzines were. Everybody was just plagiarizing from everybody else. And um, there it is. I don't know what he got so pissed off about. But when he first joined Black Flag and he grew his hair out, I go, I called Pusshead and I said, do, an, do an, a picture of Henry and make him look like a hippie, you know, with the incense burner. And so he did. Henry called at me, yelled at me, called Pusshead, yelled at him, and that was the end of our friendship. But um, just over a piece of artwork, he's a little thin-skinned. But anyway, he was kind enough to do a forward for the book, sent me a nice little uh, good job, happy for you kind of thing. So Henry never passes up a chance to self-aggrandize, so he was nice enough to write a forward for the book, along with Keith Morris and, and uh, Ian and uh, a whole bunch of people were uh, kind enough to write for the book. So. You guys got any questions? Anything else you want to hear me talk about? Um, class. <laughs> Did you do your homework. <laughs> well, talk about uh, all the other areas, like you get the guys in uh, Kalamazoo and all that. Yeah. When I discovered all you guys, they're the ones who turned me on to the regional back then, right? right absolutely. You know, they say the Detroit hardcore scene. Well, there really wasn't per se. You know, good point. There was Kalamazoo. You know, we had Violent Apathy, and then Battle Creek. We had the Latin Dogs and. Lansing, we had the Fix and the Meat Men, and then Maumee, we had the Necros, and Cleveland, we had the Pagans. They were kind of the, the old guys that started us all on the road to punk rock. But then Detroit, but we all sort of converged at the Freezer Theater. That was sort of the, the, the spot that everybody went to. I mean, but in Lansing, we had, like, the Bad Brains played two nights at Bunches Cafe, like this hippie vegan sprout place in like 1980. I think Blight, my one man, warmed him up one night and the meat man warmed him up the second night, but it's like, I look back on that now and it's like, why didn't somebody have a camera, you know? Back then the video cameras were like, you know. But it's like, holy shit, DOA and Black Flag played at Club Doobie and the Ramones would come through town and there was a frat bar called Dooley's. I saw 999. I was a, I was a big 999 fan. Those guys put on a great live show, but it was like everybody came to the freezer for like the big shows, Misfits, Minor Threat. Misfits were like Detroit, a Detroit band. I mean, that was their biggest market back then. They were they came through a lot, and um, the freezer theater was great. I mean, there'd be these legendary bands on stage, but there was a hole in the into the girls' dressing room. So, you know, Minor Threat or the Misfits would be playing. There'd be a line of guys waiting to go in there and watch girls pee through the hole in the wall. <laughs> All right, whatever you're into. I'll stay out here and watch history in the making. But Ian tells a great story about the free, the guy took the money from the Freezer Theater. And the Freezer Theater was in, like, the worst neighborhood in Detroit, the Cass Quarter. I mean, junkies, prostitutes, the whole nine yards. The guy took the door and ran, ran, you know, two blocks, Ian chasing him the whole way. Went into some, Ian said it was like something out of a Fellini movie. There was just these freak people in there. And... Ian went into this crack house, well, it wasn't crack house then, but accosted the people and got his money, but, yeah, that was uh, Detroit. John Brandon and Larissa were squatting in some, you know, illegally in some hole in the wall, but they were, they were the fun times. And then when I moved to D.C., it was the same deal. You had these, all these different, you know, pockets of suburbia all would collect at the 930 Club. You had your heavy metal band, The Obsessed. They were accepted, even though they were the long hairs. You had the drunken, drunken band, the black market baby guys. You had the straight edge bands. I mean, just everybody just seemed to get along, and, and uh, it was cool that I got to experience both scenes firsthand. <laughs> Shark. 